I guess we've all heard about the loss of the Malaysian Airlines aircraft. And how is it possible to lose an aircraft at sea? How is it possible not to be able to find that aircraft? There's 40 million US dollars that has been spent already trying to find that thing, and it's still not in sight. The reason is the oceans are huge, and the oceans are unexplored. Every time I go to sea or my colleagues go to sea, we are a little bit like those people who many centuries ago used to hack their way through the bush, finding all sorts of new things in the middle of the continents. Now, if you like, the deep sea floor are the new continents. We are the explorers. The map we have of the oceans is mostly based on satellite data. The satellites measure the height of the sea, and if there are underwater features like a volcano, like a mountain range, then the gravity pulls the sea towards those mountain ranges and causes a bump on the top of the ocean. It's not a big bump, it's about 30 centimetres maximum, but the satellites can see that and tell us there is some rock or there is some sort of volcano underneath there. Those satellites, however, are looking down from above more than 100 kilometres above the Earth's surface. So their resolution, their pixel size, if you like, is about one kilometre. Far, far, far too large to be able to see something like an aeroplane. Those satellites will never see an aeroplane lying on the seafloor, even if it's intact. The only way to have a chance of finding things on the seafloor, and still probably not an aeroplane, is to go out there with a ship and measure using sound waves. During the First World War or the Second World War, um, there were sonar techniques developed to measure the depth of water beneath a ship. Up until then, people just used plumb lines, as the ancient mariners in Phoenician times. With the advent of sonar, it was possible to measure the depth of the water below the ship. And modern ships have what we call a multi-beam sonar, which out, sends out not just a single beam down into the depth, but sends out a fan of sound waves across the seafloor. So we measure as the ship drives forward, you measure across uh, the beam of the ship. A ship travelling at perhaps 10 knots, that's 10 nautical miles an hour, is capable of mapping several tens of square kilometres an hour. The pixel size on those maps are somewhere between 50 and 100 metres. That is still possible to hide an Airbus inside that pixel. So even with ship's base measurements, you will not be able to find that aircraft. The $40 million I talked about has been spent making a ship base map of the region so that people know where to go with the real stuff you need to try and find the aircraft. To give you an idea of how long it takes to map an ocean, if you take an area uh, across the North Atlantic, just going from one side of the North Atlantic to the other, a zone probably three or 400 kilometers wide, would take approximately 40 years to map with a single ship. That's without going to port, that's without having any breakdowns, that's without taking any time off. The oceans to map the entirety of the oceans with a ship would take, with a single ship, several hundred years. And even with a fleet of ships, it's going to take a long time to do. Then, as I said, you have a map with a resolution of 50 meters per pixel. If you're lucky, you're still not going to find your, your uh, aircraft lying on the seafloor. Now, doing it with single ships is obviously not a good idea, and the future of a lot of the things we do exploring our oceans is going to involve robots. Because to map the seafloor, to travel in one direction, going 10 knots, is something that also a robotic ship can do. And the future of exploring our oceans is certainly going to involve automatic robotic ships on the surface, but then fleets of them. There are still lots of questions about the legalities of that. If one of those robots collides with another ship, who's responsible? There is no captain on a robotic ship. But when we've got those ships out there mapping the oceans, then we should be able to get a good 50 meter pixel resolution of the seafloor. That will tell us where the volcanoes are, how volcanoes are working, how landslides are proceeding. Maybe even we'll be able to see some deep water reefs and start to learn a little bit about life in the seafloor. But if we really want to get down to what you might want to call the nitty gritty, we need to go even further down in the resolution. We need a resolution of centimeters per pixel. And if we want to learn, out some, learn something about, for example, seashells on the seafloor, we need resolution of photographs. That means we need to take the vehicle off the sea surface and put it down underwater. These are going to be robots diving in the deep sea, robots that are working together as huge uh, swarms. They can map then from an altitude of 50 to 80 meters above the seafloor, going backwards and forwards, battery driven, 
the advent of mobile telephones has helped deep water search on deep water exploration enormously. We now have batteries which are very, very capable of lasting for a very, very long time. We all know how long we want our mobile phones to be on standby. That's really good for the deep sea, and we use those batteries to drive robots that traverse the deep sea uh, only very small areas at the moment. We don't have very many of these robots and they're very expensive. But when we get more of them, when the price comes down, there will be fleets of robots flying perhaps 50, 100 meters above the deep sea floor. Those are the robots that can find lost aircraft, for example, on the sea floor. I personally have been involved in the search for uh, one of the downed aircraft, the Air France aircraft, which was lost in the center of the Atlantic. There we used deep diving robots to finally find traces of the turbines and the wheels lying on the seafloor. Those robots can then be reconfigured to take pictures of the seafloor. To get good pictures underwater, you need to be within 10 meters of the seafloor. If you fit up the cameras on those robots so that they can take those pictures, you fit up the lights and the flashlights, because of course you need plenty of lighting down there, then you can take pictures that are capable of showing you the pictures of a downed aircraft, but also showing you pictures of animals living on the seafloor. We're going to find out lots about what animals do in the deep sea when we are, have those photographs from the deep sea floor. So we're at the beginning of the exploration of the world's oceans. We know perhaps 10% of the surface of the ocean or the surface of the sea floor is known from that type of ship-based mapping. The type of deep submersible robot mapping has not covered anywhere near 1% of the sea floor. There's still lots to do. There's still lots to discover. There's lots to discover about life on our planet. There's lots to discover about how our planet works and also lots to discover about how we can preserve that planet, how we can look after it and how we are possibly impacting it at the moment.